Hi, I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now!, your daily unembedded international independent grassroots news hour. You're watching Cambridge Community Television, the number one public access media center in this country. My name is Kathy Hoffman, uh, the former director of the Cambridge Peace Commission, and um, it's really uh, an enormous honor to be helping to host this event this evening. Um, it is an event long time uh, in the making, and as a result, a one that, for a number of you know, carries a particular poignancy for the members of the Peace Commission um, in particular, and the community that care deeply about understanding the dual narratives that exist in Israel and Palestine, um, and committed to working deeply and strongly and fiercely and lovingly for a resolution that brings justice and dignity for the peoples in the Middle East. And no one exemplifies that more than uh, Peace Commissioner Hilda Silverman, who is really uh, the inspiration behind this event. Um, some of us had actually read the book uh, recommended by different people, and we weren't surprised to find Hilda in the book <laughs> um, because her activities and commitments extend over many decades um, and really involve listening deeply and hearing people's voices, particularly those voices uh, which have been marginalized, whether those are uh, Jewish or Israeli voices for Palestinian justice or whether those are the voices of Palestinians. And for those of you who don't know, um, Hilda died last Monday May 5th, um, just short of being able to be here in physical body. Um, but in a number of people's words, um, including I think Sarah's and Hillary's and Sandy's, Hilda's presence uh, is very vivid. Um, some of us went to a, a gathering uh, yesterday, Sunday, to talk about her, and people kept saying that one of their sort of moral standards was to ask the question, what would Hilda do? Um, and uh, Hilda would be pleased to see so many of you here today. Um, so on her behalf, I welcome and thank you for coming. Um, two announcements. Uh, tomorrow night is the Holocaust Commemoration Program at Temple Beth Shalom. Um, and there are flyers out in the hallway for that. Um, we are, we're, there are a number of other events happening this week. There's also an event uh, sponsored by the Peace Commission, the Planet Walker, tomorrow night. So we invite people to be in spiritually in two places at the same time, um, even as you may make one choice physically. Um, so, um, the, also, we had, we had thought that, um, well, there will be a reception after the program, um, and Sandy's agreed to sign books and engage in conversation, and we thought that would happen in the room next door, which would have made some sense, but it's booked. So we're, as we have always done as activists and humanitarians, we're improvising, and the reception will be in the front of the room to your right, so we invite you to stay and drink punch and eat something and replenish the body as well. Um, finally, I just want to offer my, you'll see in the program there are a few thank yous. Uh, thank you to the Y and, and Chauncey for making this space available without charge for this event. Um, and others who made this possible. And in particular, I want to thank the three people who are gonna share some remarks with you. Um, their bios are in the program, so I'm not going to spend time on that.
um, except that we thought it an important um, and exciting opportunity as an opening for Sandy's remarks um, to invite someone whose voice in uh, the Jewish community of activism and ethics and conscience is unparalleled, who is Sarah Roy, and a Palestinian woman whose voice and contribution is unparalleled in its work, in her work, both for understanding the realities of Palestinians, but also for people for whom the dual narratives are deeply meaningful and deeply felt. So we are going to open with a few shared remarks by Hilary Rentizi and Sarah Roy, and then they will be followed by Sandy, and then there will be about 15 minutes at the end before the reception for questions and answers. So that's my introduction, and part of it is to say I feel like we are just part of one community. So the, I don't want to do more singling out than that other than say uh, how much the two of you and Sandy, your words and work have meant for me and I think for many in this room, and we thank you for sharing your time tonight and for the work that you're doing every day. Thank you. Please welcome Sarah Roy and Hilary Rantizi. Thank you very much. I just have a few words that I'd like to read, and they are um, about Hilda. Hilda died last week after a courageous battle with cancer. And as Kathy said, she played a key role in making this event possible. Hilda greatly admired Sandy Tolan and his corpus of work, including his book, The Lemon Tree. In fact, she was very passionate about this book, and I would like to take a few moments to explain why. As many of you know, Hilda was fiercely committed to issues of social and political justice and to righting wrongs of all kinds, including and perhaps most especially those committed by her own people. Hilda was deeply Jewish in the truest sense of what it means to be a Jew. She lived a moral, ethical, and examined life and was absolutely consistent in her values and beliefs. She constantly questioned herself as well as others in her unrelenting search for truth. She was a light among us. Through her work and her courage, Hilda aimed and succeeded in helping the Jewish community and those outside of it to understand the Palestinian perspective, to understand Palestinian suffering and, suffering and hopes, and the injustice inflicted on Palestinians by the Jewish people. But she was also able to help Palestinians understand Jewish fears and uncertainties and Jewish dreams. In so doing, Hilda was able to bring awareness and forge connections that most of us can only aspire to. Among her many gifts, this was perhaps her greatest. And it is Hilda's commitment to mutual understanding and reconciliation between the Palestinian and Jewish peoples that Sandy's book embodies, and why Hilda was so anxious for this event to take place. So I'm delighted and honored to welcome you all here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing about Hilda Silverman and the huge impact that she's had on many of our lives and on the community here. Among Hilda's many attributes was her ability to listen thoughtfully to question and to challenge herself as well, as well as others around her. She didn't have formulaic answers to questions and wasn't concerned with fitting in. She was concerned with the truth and she was concerned with the human experience and humanizing situations that needed to be humanized. The situation in Israel, Palestine is one that cries out for people like Hilda people with compassion, empathy, integrity, honesty, and a lot of courage. Today we're going to hear from Sandy Tolan as he reads from his book, The Lemon Tree. 
And what this book does is humanize. It is in the spirit of this book and in the spirit of Hilda that we can be empowered to make change for the better. I shared with Hilda that there's a small part of the book that took place in my home while I was growing up in Ramallah. I was a little girl when the two main characters, Bashir Khairi and Dalia Landau, first met. My father was a conduit that arranged the first meeting between the two. I remember the sense of excitement as well as the secrecy in our home as they met in our living room for the first time. We didn't know then what the outcome would be or that one day many people would get to hear the stories of these two remarkable people and their struggles to make a difference. Today, as we gather to hear, San to hear from Sandy, I cannot ignore that this whole month is a month of remembrance for many Israelis, a celebration of the founding of the State of Israel, and for all Palestinians mourning the loss and dispossession of their land and homes in 1948, a dispossession that continues to this day. Today, as we gather here in Cambridge, we are connected in one way or another. We can choose to hear each other, to be thoughtful, to act with integrity and honesty, or not. We can choose to humanize or demonize. We can choose to be bystanders and observers or proactive in making change. I want to thank Sandy for being with us this evening and for, for his gift to all of us. I know for a fact that his book has, has changed perceptions of many, of Palestinians and Israelis and the reality on the ground. I want to thank you for this. It's my honor to be part of this event this evening and my honor to invite Sandy to come up to the podium. Please join me in welcoming him. Wow. Thank you for such, um, such a beautiful introduction, but really for, I remember when, when Hilda called me, it was, geez, maybe almost a year ago, and uh, she was the first person to, 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 to get in touch and talk about this, and, and I remember thinking what, what an honor it would be to, to be here, and do, um, to talk to you all, uh, but in the, the context and the, and the beautiful words that, that Sarah and Hillary have just read, um, it, it makes it all the more uh, moving to me to stand here before you, and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing, sharing my thoughts with you, and thanks also to, to Kathy and the Peace Commission and uh, my friends and colleagues. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, I want to do something a little different than what I often do, which is I often just tell a little bit of the story of the book and, and read um, a passage here and there. But, uh, but rather than that, I'd actually like to take this moment, um, given that it's the 13th of May tomorrow, uh, being the 60th anniversary of the day that David Ben-Gurion declared Israel's independence and the war uh, began the next day on May 15th, uh, the event known as the War of Independence from one perspective, or the catastrophe, the Nakba from another. And so what I want to do is, is try to explore that in a, in a slightly more formal way and invite, of course, your own um, questions towards the end. Um, but I'd like, to, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the backstory of the book, um, how I came to write it, and then perhaps to trace throughout these last 60 years some moments in which we could be encouraged to, to see um, see the other. Uh, and um, I just want to say one more time what it is an honor, uh, what an honor it is to be here. Um, and I do feel um, that um, uh, I wanted so much to be able to have, uh, to have Hilda here and to be able to visit her. And I'm so sorry that that can't be happened, but I do feel like her spirit is definitely here. So, so like a lot of people in this room, I grew up uh, with the story of the birth of Israel out of the Holocaust. Not as a Jew, I'm a Midwestern Catholic boy with Irish and German roots, uh, but nevertheless, personally in my own community, from my friends and carpool mates on the way to elementary school, 
the story I heard was this. In the late 1930s, my, the mother of my friend Tracy was trying to get out of Amsterdam. Uh, the family lived in Anne Frank's neighborhood, and uh, my, my friend's grandfather, an Orthodox Jew, was waiting in line one day uh, to get uh, tickets on a steamship. Um, but he got tickets, but the trip was to fall on the Sabbath. And so the father, a devout man, refused them and returned home. His wife and children, including Tracy's mom, were furious. This was an emergency. One can make exceptions when lives are on the line. That ship, the one they would have traveled on, was torpedoed. And I don't know how many people died. Some weeks later, the family made its way out of Amsterdam, traveling to South America, and then eventually settling in Milwaukee, uh, where they became close friends of my parents. So this ideal of, uh, of Israel being a safe haven for Jews that survived the trauma of the Holocaust was burned into me early. And from time to time, I would think about it as I rolled to school with Tracy. In larger terms, in the larger narratives uh, that we tell ourselves as a society here in the US, as a culture, uh, you might say that most of us, Jew or Gentile, grew up with some version of the story, some far more, for, for, far more horrific, some more general. In a way, we might call this the Leon Uris narrative, as told in his best-selling novel, Exodus, and then the film with Paul Newman. A version of, a version of it, a more merciful kind, lives in the story of Dali Eshkenazi Landau, who you've just heard about, one of the characters at the heart of the lemon tree who in November 1948, five years after her family and tens of thousands of other Bulgarian Jews incredibly escaped the Holocaust. And we have friends here uh, who know quite a bit about that. I've, I've been blessed with so many wonderful colleagues and people who became friends who were so generous with their time um, and, and uh, their, their phone numbers and, and the, the kinds of help I had in many parts of the world, especially, of course, Israel and Palestine was um, such that I could have never written the book without it. But uh, it was five years uh, after that uh, incredible event known as the rescue of the Bulgarian Jews in November 1948 um, that Dahlia lay in a wicker basket 10 months old at the train station at Sofia as her parents hugged goodbye to relatives and a train clacked and rambled, rumbled west to the Adriatic port of Bakr where a boat would take them to the new state of Israel. Now, there's such power in that narrative. There's such truth in it. But in the larger sense, that, that Exodus narrative, the, the Eurus narrative, as told by Eurus, it carries just the truth of one side. And it simply isn't possible to understand what's happening in the Middle East today without understanding that there is another side and that it has its own power and truth. For me, it wasn't until years later uh, 1993 to be specific, when I began to understand more deeply the other side of the story. As it was then, I became close to a Palestinian journalist, Lamise Andoni, here at Harvard on a Neiman Fellowship where we both were. Lamise and I were later married. We were married for eight years. And because of this, in both personal and professional ways, I began to understand the depth and power of another people's narrative as well. And I had access and understanding to the Palestinian narratives that few Western journalists uh, have been uh, as fortunate as I, as I have been to have. And yet at the same time, during much of this time, I was a consultant to the oral history department of the U.S. Holocaust Museum, getting further insight into the trauma of survivors and the wish of many of them, though not all, but many, to see Israel as a safe haven. And so what I wanted to do with the lemon tree um, and its story of two people with common roots in the house and what I want to do with, with you this evening in a somewhat different way is to juxtapose the more familiar, that, that Exodus narrative with uh, at least more familiar to many of us, not everyone in this room, um, juxtapose that more familiar with the less familiar. Uh, for if the dark heart uh, of one narrative of the Holocaust, uh, is the Holocaust, then the dark heart of the other is the Nakba. If the meaning of 1948 for one side is the War of Independence, the meaning of the other for the other side is the Nakba. And I don't think one can begin to understand the other, the other side of these two great tragic narratives from these two great peoples without understanding the Nakba. So I'm going to begin on a hot, brutal afternoon in the middle of July 1948, not quite 60 years ago, with the Palestinian Khairi family and six-year-old Bashir, the other car a character at the heart of the lemon tree. 
12 years earlier, his father Ahmad uh, had built a house of Jerusalem stone and planted a lemon tree in the backyard. It was nearly 60 years ago, just hours after the conquering Israeli army in July 1948 arrived in the Palestinian cities of Lid and Ramleh. Those towns had been designated for the Arab side and the two-state partition, but now, after the Arab side rejected the partition, the future shape of Palestine was anyone's guess. The boundaries of the state, David Ben-Gurion wrote in his memoirs, will not be determined by a UN resolution, but by the force of arms. The Israelis would soon control 78% of Palestine rather than the 54% they were granted in the partition vote in the United Nations. Now, as we'll see in a moment, the, the strategic vision, vision for a new Israel did not include tens of thousands of Arabs from these two towns, especially in the corridor between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, uh, including, um, and, and so that on that searing July day, Thousands of Palestinians, including many in Bashir's family, moved through the hills on foot. Some had been forced to march from the town of Lid at gunpoint. Others, mostly from Ramleh, were taken by bus to the front lines of the Arab Legion at Latrun, where they walked in the direction of Salbit, a village to the north. The families had left nearly everything behind, furniture, clothes, pictures, bracelets of coral and amber, orchards of oranges and olives and almonds, fields of wheat, mountain lilies, jasmine, and scarlet anemone. In part, because they assumed that they would be coming back when the Arab Legion recaptured the town, but mostly because they had to march through the hills. Bashir's cousin, Firdaus Taji, who was, a, what, she, she was about 16 at the time, and she was known as a girl guide, which in happier times, less violent times, would have been like a Girl Scout, but at this time, was more like, she was more like a young nurse. She and other witnesses I spoke with recalled stumbling over rocks, thorns, and wheat stalks cut short from a recent harvest. It was blazing hot. People began wandering off course in search of any sign of water. One family came upon a cornfield and sucked the moisture out of kernels. Others found an old shallow well with a broken rope. Women recalled removing their dresses, dipping them into the stagnant water, and sucking the moisture from it. Firdaus Taji told me she witnessed people drinking their own urine. And this is what happens sometimes. I remember living in Arizona when people died coming up from El Salvador, and that was um, what they had resorted to as well. John Baggett Glubb, the British commander of the Arab Legion, whose troops had just retreated from the two towns, heard the reports and wrote later, it was a blazing day in the coastal plains, the temperature about 100 degrees in the shade. Refugees were crossing stony fallow covered with thorn bushes. In the end, he wrote, nobody will ever know how many children died. On July 15, 1948, two months after he declared Israel's independence, David Ben-Gurion, who also was the first prime minister of Israel, confirmed the movement of Palestinians through the hills toward Ramallah. He wrote in his diary, the Arab Legion has wired that there are 30,000 refugees moving along the road between Lid and Ramla who are infuriated with the Legion. They are demanding bread. They should be taken across the Jordan River, he declared, meaning to Jordan where King Abdullah would be saddled with the refugees. And I think Ben-Gurion's quote is important because it also because it supports the argument that the expulsions were part of the strategy, at least in this case, of war and state building. Uh, indeed, Yagal alone, the head of the Palmach, which was a, a kind of uh, strike brigade, uh, as he chronicled in an article in a military journal later that year, late in 1948, had already considered the strategic advantages of expulsion. Driving the Arabs out of Lid and Ramla would alleviate the pressure from an armed and hostile population. It would clog the roads, he wrote, seriously hampering any e efforts by Glub's Arab Legion to retake the town and the sudden arrival of tens of thousands of destitute refugees in Ramallah would place a huge burden on King Abdullah, and indeed it did. Now, perhaps from a military uh, point of view, this strategy made sense, uh, strictly from a military point of view. But in the summer and spring and summer of 1948, the bulk of three quarters of a million Palestinian refugees fled or were driven out of their homes. And nearly every one of them, like the child Bashir, would dream of returning at all costs. Their attachment to the land and the things they left behind is possibly the most underestimated and misunderstood aspect to me 
of this entire conflict. I've spent so many hours in refugee camps in the West Bank, Gaza and Lebanon, places where the dirt streets are named after Palestinian towns that the grandparents and great-grandparents fled or were driven out of 60 years ago. Haifa, Jaffa, Al-Quds, Ramla, Lid. In the Ayn al-Hilawe refugee camp in southern Lebanon, I met an old man who likes to gather his children together to draw a map of the village. Here's the bakery, there's the mosque, there's Mr. Abed's house, a village that has not existed in 50 years. Each year in the memory, the images become more beautiful, the apricots more sweet and more heavy, the Arabic swip script above a carved stone doorway more perfect. In the case of Bashir, he could not stop thinking about the lemon tree his father had planted in the backyard of the family's home in Ramle. Someday he knew he would come home to taste its fruit again. He knew that. He believed that with everything he had. Someday the family would return. Now four months later, that boat in the Adriatic, the Pan York, had left the port of Bakr. And on the morning of November 3rd, 1948, it steamed into Haifa port. On board were Moshe and Solia Eshkenazi and their daughter Dahlia, 11 months old now, in her wicker basket. For so many Jews who arrived on those boats in the early days of the Jewish state, especially those who had last lost entire families in the Holocaust, the sight of the lights on the hill of Carmel was overwhelming. People cried, began singing Hatikva, and kissed the ground when they stepped off the gangplank. The Ashkenazi stepped off the Pan York on November 3rd, 1948. On shore, officials of the Jewish agency sat at tables behind a roped line. They took names and years of birth, handed out sandwiches, sprayed the new arrivals with DDT. This was before Rachel Carson that that was not a very good idea. Uh, people did that uh, in places at that time. And put many of them, including the Ashkenazis, on a narrow gauge, yellow, yellow narrow gauge train where Moshe, Soli, and Dahlia would begin their life in Israel with thousands of other immigrants in what people at the time called in Israel the ingathering of nations. It wasn't long before Moshe became restless. In a matter of days, he heard of some new immigrants signing up to move to a town he had never heard of. For the new family, Tel Aviv was not really an option. There wasn't much room left, and Jerusalem was still too dangerous. So why not, he thought, let's try this town called Ramle. And that is where on November 15, 1948, the young family arrived. Early arrivals to the town recall a place under Israeli military occupation. Some remember belongings strewn in the street. One recalled a burning mattress, another a donkey tied to a post in front of a house with no front door. Rows of Arab houses stood empty. Moshe and family got off the bus and were met by officials of the Jewish agency. Arriving residents would recall a simple procedure. They were free to choose a house, inspect it, and claim it. The paperwork would come later. I've often wondered what was going on, what was going on, what was going through their head? Did they wonder who had lived here before? Can you imagine yourself being in that place, in that situation? The family found a house to its liking. It was made of Jerusalem stone. There was plenty of light, and in the backyard, you could imagine there was a lemon tree. I'd like you to imagine for a moment yourself as the child Bashir, growing up in exile, first in Ramallah, then in Gaza, from age six for 19 years, really all you want to do is go home. Occasionally you wonder, who is in our home? Is it still standing? But you believe it must be, it has to be. It's everything, it's your breath, it's your bread, it's your currency. It's all anyone you know cares about. Return by any means necessary. Now, I'd like you to imagine what it would be like to grow up in this town, in this house, having escaped a terrible calamity and knowing only this place as your home from 11 months old. You have a right to be here because this is your safe haven. You have a right to be here, but who are these people who want to drive you out? Are they the same people who lived in your home before you did? And did they really run away like cowards, as you've learned in school with the st soup still boiling on the stove? Did they really, as one of the school textbooks at the time said, prefer to leave? 19 years after you arrived from Bulgaria, on another hot July day after the Six-Day War, jumping ahead now to 1967, 
Imagine being inside your home, inside that stone home, when the doorbell rings. Now outside the gate, outside the home, at the same gate that your father built in 1936, imagine being the man ringing that bell and wondering who will come to answer it. Imagine. Dahlia walked softly down the path to the green metal gate, opened the gate with a large key, and saw three Arab men in suits and ties in the middle of the stifling Israeli summer heat. And she realized almost immediately, she told me when I interviewed her much later, that this is the enemy, literally, the enemy at the gate. And she knew immediately who these men were and why they had come. She said, she told me. Across from her stood Bashir. For 19 years, he thought he would be returning home in triumph. Instead, he stood politely at the gate, mustering up the words to ask permission simply to look inside his house. He tells a stranger who holds the key, this is my father's house, and I lived here too. And could we come in to see the house? And now one more time imagine being in Dahlia's place. You are staring at those men. You know who they are. They are your enemy, as you understand it, and yet you sense no threat from them. You should not let them in. You're home alone. Your parents are at work. You're 19 years old. There are three of them. And yet you actually say to yourself at that moment, it's as if I've always been waiting for them. And you could say at this moment embedded in 60 years of strife is about enemies facing each other. But in deeper ways, in, in, my, in my view, it's not about enemies or hatred or war. It's not about exploding buses in Tel Aviv or helicopter gunships firing rockets into Gaza. It's not about the horror of a young man blowing himself up in a nightclub or a child shot down with a stone in its hand. It's not about the terrible and endless repetition of bloody images, those miles of videotape and forests of newspapers that have fallen and that cause us to call out loud and say, not again, haven't I read this before? This moment, I think, is about something just very simple. It's about home. If you were in Bashir's place on that July day 40 plus years ago, would you have swallowed your pride after such humiliation in the war, boarded a bus with strangers, ridden into your old town, now laced with signs in a strange language you don't understand, strange to you because you don't even, can't even make out the letters, and then made your way to the front gate, ringing the bell, inviting rejection and denial? If you were Dahlia, facing the enemy at the gate, looking at them as they waited for your re reply, would you have had the courage to follow the voice inside you? Would I have? Yes, Dahlia said to the three Arab men, and she smiled. Please come in. So today I want to talk at least a little bit about possibility. If the fabric is dark, if the mutual trauma seems to obscure promise, we nevertheless can look at moments when possibility, chance, hope at the right angle in the right light with the right shifting of the cloth will sparkle just enough to grab our attention. In its own, in its own modest inchoate way, I suppose one possible source of hope of identifying possibility is to shift the way we pay attention to the reality. For if we go back to the Leon Uris narrative, the birth of Israel against all odds in a hostile sea, a fragile Dara, Ara, uh, David amidst the Arab Goliath, we know that this gives us a powerful understanding of reality. But it's not balanced by any, understa any understanding of how the other side sees it. So let's look through the lens of a nation born of the deepest kind of trauma, where never again is the mantra of an entire nation, but now let's also pick up the lens of another people where the Nakba and the love of a home lost lives in the memory and the blood and breath of nearly every person dreaming about another yet unformed nation. And of course, to understand the truth and even to be human in this world, we must try to understand, come to grips with the terrible, terrible trauma and horror of the Holocaust. Many people here, some people here know that on a more deeper familial experience. And of course, we must not forget. But I'd say this to uh, sort of my larger group of country, countrymen, what do we know of the Nakba? Uh, 
These two terrible things can't be compared. They are different in so many ways, yet they each form the dominant narrative of their people in relation to the other. And so don't we need to understand both? So let's try to dig deeper, probe further into the layers of sediment in these 60 years. We know that in November 1947, when the UN voted to partition Palestine into two states, that the great majority of Jews in Palestine and around the world accepted this and rejoiced. And we know that the Arab side rejected this and pledged to fight it, even to wage war against it. But can we imagine ourselves into the Palestinian point of view during this time? In fact, the Palestinians wanted to know why should the other side, with one-third the population owning 7% of the land, be awarded 54% of the land and more than 80% of its cultivated citrus and grain plantations. Some on the Arab side had pushed for an alternative solution, uh, a single state for Arabs and Jews, with a constitution respecting human rights and fundamental freedoms without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religions. Some Zionists on the left, including Albert Einstein and Martin Buber, had also searched for models of coexistence. Einstein called for an ever-present manifest desire to institute complete equality for the Arab citizens living in our midst. The attitude we adopt toward the Arab minority will provide the real test of our moral standards of a people, Einstein, as a people, Einstein said. And earlier, Buber had advocated a, bina advocated a binational state based in part of the love for their homeland that the two peoples share. I think that's often forgotten that there were voices like this at that time. Nevertheless, we know that Jew and Gentile alike around the world, upon hearing the outcome of the UN vote, saw it, in the words of historian Michael Cohen, as Western civilization's gesture of repentance for the Holocaust, the repayment of a debt owed by those nations that realized that they might have done more to prevent or at least limit the scale of Jewish tragedy during World War II. Can we imagine how the Palestinians felt about this in particular? The Palestinians failed to see while they, why they should be made to pay for the Holocaust, wrote the Harvard Palestinian scholar, Walid Khalidi, in his book, Before Their Diaspora. Why was it not fair for the Jews to be a minority in a unitary Palestinian state, while it was fair for almost half of the Palestinian population, the indigenous majority on its ancestral soil, to be converted overnight into a minority under alien rule in the envisaged Jewish state according to partition. And yes, we know that the armies of Arab nations crossed the borders of the new Israeli state 60 years ago with the intent of preventing the state from being established. But do we know how the Palestinians living in cities and villages saw this? Could we see into the hopes of a family like the Khairis, who, terrified by the April 1948 massacre in the village of Dar Yassin, Fearful of some reprisal massacre as the Irgun militia pounded Ramla, saw the pending arrival of the Arab Legion in completely different terms? And can we see that when, that arri what, then, that when what arrived rather than the Legion was a group of brave but undisciplined, ill-equipped, barefooted Bedouins who used their old rifles to shoot pigeons for food? That the idea of a monolithic Arab army poised to defeat Israel ended up to so many Palestinians, especially the villagers, as a joke. Which is not to say that there were not armies fighting, but what arrived in the defense of many Palestinians was not what is portrayed today. Yes, we know so well the image of a fragile Israel, tiny in a sea of Arab fury. We know that David Ben-Gurion framed the struggle in 1948 as 700,000 Jews pitted against 27 million Arabs, one against 40. But the actual strength of forces on the ground was roughly even in 1948. John and David Kimche, the Israeli historians, wrote in Clash of Destinies that the total strength of the invading Arab armies was 24,000 compared with 35,000 for the Haganah, with the Arab armies initially possessing greater firepower. And we know that Israel gained a significant advantage uh, in firepower after breaking the arms embargo in the summer of 1948. Let's go forward 19 years. Uh, there's a similar story about the uh, Israeli for uh, the Egyptian forces poised on the border of Sinai, 100,000 troops poised to attack. Uh, 
And we know that throughout Israel, the specter of the death camps in Europe and the fear of another Holocaust gripped and nearly paralyzed an entire people, stoking fears of an Egyptian invasion. But less known is that US and British intelligence put the number of Egyptian troops at 50,000 and is strictly defensive in nature. And that President Johnson, uh, upon a meeting with Israeli Foreign Minister Abba Ibn in 1967 in May, said that all US intelligence agencies had concluded that Egypt would not attack, and that if it did, you will whip the hell out of them. And that Nicholas Katzenbach, the US Under Secretary of State, said the intelligence was absolutely flat on the fact that the Israelis could mop up the Arabs in no time flat. Today, 40 plus years later, we know of the Qasem rockets pounding Sterot. We know that 13 people have died there, tragically, unnecessarily, in the last seven years, and that for those families there can be no consolation. And that for countless of their neighbors, the terror that reignites old trauma, much like in 1967, is impossible to measure. But can we imagine what it's like to be a Palestinian in a Gaza refugee when the Israeli military response, for example, known as the one known as Summer Rains explodes all around you in numbers many times those of the Qasem rockets. Can you imagine being the father to the three children killed along with your wife eating breakfast a couple of weeks ago? Just six days uh, from earlier this year, one example from B'Tselem, the, U the uh, human rights organization in Israel, 106 Palestinians killed in six days, 54 civilian non-combatants, 25 under the age of 18. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Camp David because I think it's another place where uh, we hear more one version of the story. Uh, one of the many, many efforts over the years to reach some sort of resolution. Um, this recent one in, in the year 2000 was when Yasser Arafat rejected overtures from Ehud Barak and Bill Clinton, and everything fell apart again in a wave of suicide bombings. Ariel Sharon's visit to the Temple Mount, the Al-Aqsa Intifada is born, and Arafat is assigned by many nearly all the blame for failing to compromise. This is the lens that most of us were invited to see through in reams of articles and endless commentaries. But can we pick up the other lens now and try to see it through the Arab side? In the Camp David process, Arafat and the Palestinians had agreed to one single state on 22% of the land they had fought for, for during decades of what they called their liberation struggle. They believed they had already compromised and now it was time for Israel to do the same. Late in the Camp David negotiations and discussing the holy sites, President Clinton proposed a sovereign presidential compound for Arafat and his successors inside the Muslim holy quarter, uh, Muslim quarter of the holy city. So there will be a small island surrounded by Israeli soldiers who control the entrances? Arafat told the president, this is not what we are asking for. We are asking for full Palestinian sovereignty over Jerusalem, occupied in 1967. Now imagine if you can being in Arafat's position. For Arafat, it was not just his leadership of his people's struggle for 35 years that prevented him from, being, from agreeing to terms he knew many of his people would reject. It was also his official role in the Muslim world in safeguarding this whole, those holy sites. And so Arafat, when asked by President Clinton to concede what he felt was the impossible regarding the holy sites in the old city, looked at the president and asked, do you want to come to my funeral? Last October, when I was in Israel, I visited Uzi Dayan, the tough Israeli general who was at Camp David at that time in 2000, and opposed it from Israel's perspective because he thought they were giving away too much. And yet, we talked about this. Yes, he told me, well aware of how Arafat was cast at the, as the spoiler at Camp David. There was no way Arafat could agree to this. And so there was an end of hope in some large way at the end of 2000, the beginning of the Al-Aqsa Intifada, the resumption of suicide bombings, the obliteration of Palestinian government offices, its models, modest symbols of security by, by uh, the forces led by Ariel Sharon, then the Prime Minister, and then in September of that year, the attacks on the World Trade Center, which transformed the region's politics forever. 
I could keep going over all these peace plans, most of them since 1967, geared toward what we know as the two-state solution, mostly based on UN Resolution 242, and carrying the names of the cities and towns in which they were conceived among great hopes and dreams. But instead, I want to take you to just one place right now, back to the West Bank uh, and the land in question, Israel and Palestine, to look at the question uh, to resolution again through two sets of eyes, and eventually to argue that hope lies at this moment less in the details of roadmaps as it does in the possibility of broadening one's point of view and perhaps in understanding things in a new way. I was last, as I said, in, in Israel-Palestine in October, uh, and I was looking at the questions of how difficult uh, the, the resolution of this conflict have become even more and more difficult, uh, although as hard as said is to believe, um, more and more difficult than it has in, in even recent years. Especially, and I know many of you have traveled to the region, um, you can understand just how permanent the infrastructure that Israel has built in the West Bank. So many more of those smooth of, as glass, settlers only road, expanded settlements perched on hilltops, the 25 foot high wall slicing through the landscape well inside the West Bank. In some cases, the wall gives way to layers of electrified fencing, fence after moat after fence after moat, and what has cut off, cut off many farmers from their olive trees and other crops and the hundreds of checkpoints, some of which have been transformed into something akin to international border crossing. Uh, I, I kept trying to imagine these things being dismantled for a two-state solution. One day I rode in a minivan taking Palestinians from the old city to Bethlehem, and after my meetings there on my way back, I got a ride to the wall and gate in a taxi. Um, the wall is actually right at the gate at Bethlehem. It's actually a single file walkway, maybe 150, 50 feet long with high metal bars along its length on either side and above, single file each way. When you finally emerge through the turnstiles and come out on the other end of the wall, you look back beneath the armed watch tower near the top of the wall to a huge sign in Arabic, English, and Hebrew, peace be with you. Is this, I wondered, the future infrastructure of a two-state solution? Or are these new facts on the ground, are these the new facts on the ground that seal off Bethlehem from Jerusalem, posing huge obstacles to any meaningful Palestinian state? Even if the political will existed, the immensity of the necessary changes to the land alone is, to put it modestly, daunting. The settlements are the heart of the problem, of course, and not simply because there are a few outposts and small enclaves housing ardent aspirants to a biblical view of ancient Israel. We are talking about more than villages. Consider Ariel. This Israeli settlement juts 11 miles inside the West Bank, or more than one-third its width. In other words, deep inside any future Palestinian state. This former outpost is no center for religious fanatics. It is essentially suburban Israel, a small, largely secular city of 18,000, and an easy commute to Tel Aviv. In Ariel, I met a young, red-haired American, Avi Zimmerman who, with the blessing of Israeli authorities, regularly travels to Los Angeles, New Jersey, and Florida as part of his recruitment effort to entice American Jews to come to Ariel. Local boosters call the place both a city and a village with a hometown sort of feeling. Ariel say its leaders is here to stay. Given the political atmosphere, especially the utter absence of American pressure on Israel, there is virtually nothing to suggest otherwise. On most maps I've seen outlining the two-state solution, Ariel is included on the Israeli side of the separation wall. For Palestinians, Ariel is a blade cutting through the middle of the Palestinian district of Salfit. If, for example, Osame Ode, an electrical engineer and sometime olive farmer, wants to travel the four miles from a village of Bidya to visit friends in a nearby village, he must drive about 25 miles crossing several checkpoints where he will show documents, open his trunk, and face questions about his intentions and past whereabouts. The journey can take an hour or two, or he might get turned back at the first checkpoint or the third. For villagers without a car, the vast majority, the trip becomes impractical, thus encouraging political and social fragmentation. Multiply this scenario by unknown dozens, smaller settlements, creating similar drive-arounds, Israeli security patrols intended as part of a permanent solution, 
according to some analysis, restricting movement between Palestinian towns, and the ring of massive Israeli suburbs cutting off East Jerusalem from the West Bank, and it's clear that a meaningful sovereign Palestinian state in the current reality is becoming harder and harder to imagine. Proposed workarounds by some Israeli map makers, including dozens of tunnels and flyover ramps and bridges, are not exactly what Palestinians had in mind during their decades of hopes for their own independent state. If the two-state solution then does not come about, what will? For many Palestinians and a handful of Israelis, this is a one-state solution, a politically explosive idea with many permutations. Proponents of a one-state solution say the Israeli occupation is now an annexation and that the only just solution is to acknowledge that and fight for a single state where everyone will be treated as equal citizens. Some proponents say this must include the Palestinian right of return, which Israelis insist would be the end of the Jewish state. Others say, no, you could have a binational state with Israel retaining its inherent Jewishness, and others scoff at this as a dangerous pipe dream. And yet so many of the people who have believed in two states, so many of them are just growing weary and despondent. Like Amin, the East Jerusalem taxi driver who drove me around the West Bank for a couple of days, bright, capable, warm, funny, lively young man who wants to marry his sweetheart from his mother, mother's West Bank village, but she can't live with him at least for seven years while she applies for residency. And if he goes to live with her 20 minutes away, mind you, he will lose his residency. So it is love or home, but not both, in the case of Amin. Or Zahra, from an old and famous Palestinian Jerusalem family who for years has believed in dialogue with the other side, has spent years of her life engaging, discussing, arguing, dialoguing with Israelis, all in the hopes of a better way for both sides, but who told me over dinner in the old city that she thinks she had was has wasted years of her life on this and that she has just about lost hope and is ready to give up or so many of my Israeli friends, two of whom, Patty and Golda, long believers in the peace movement and in being part of building the dream of coexistence, have retreated from Jerusalem after 2000 into the Negev, working their daily lives in a quieter place with more modest intentions. So if new to, no two-state solution and no one-state solution, what? Some more morose surrealists talk bleakly of a one-and-a-half-state solution with a lesser occupation, but Israeli retaining, Israel retaining control of huge chunks of the West Bank through the wall and patrols of the Jordan Valley and elsewhere on the West Bank. The status quo more or less with occasional spurts of violence by the weaker party and massive retaliation by the stronger one. Is that the future? Where the contact between two great peoples is between the bus rider and the bomber, the soldier and the stone thrower, the occupier and the occupied? At dusk one evening in late October, my young friend Amin, the taxi driver, and I were coming back to Jerusalem through the West Bank when the orange tile, where the orange-tiled roofs of the settlements peered down on the whitewashed mosques and stone homes of the Palestinian villages. And there by the side of the road, we drove past yet another checkpoint. Our plates were Jerusalem yellow, so we could drive past while the West Bank blues were required to stop for inspection by Israeli soldiers. And there by the side of the road as we flashed by, I could see the soldiers had ordered a group of riders out of their van. They were sitting in a row on a guardrail at dusk, heads down as the soldiers' automatic rifles slung over their shoulders were inspecting their papers. And there's just a small scene, a daily scene. It's almost mundane if you travel a lot in the West Bank, but no less heartbreaking for me the first time of the thousandth. And I thought to myself, what I suppose is obvious, something has gone terribly wrong. Not simply with these soldiers and these use at this so-called flying checkpoint. No, I mean here, great-grandsons of the families who survived the worst humanity has ever suffered. The grandchildren of the Jews of Yemen and Morocco and Iraq who sought a life here in the 1950s. The daughters of Ethiopia locked in a terrible recurring nightmare with the sons and grandsons and granddaughters and great-great-grandchildren of Palestine. There is another way. Even though it only seems to ever get worse, there has to be. And so in a rather humble search for anything positive, we can say a source of hope is simply that things must change because the status quo is unacceptable. And I realize that that in itself is not very encouraging. But what if it is actually not so modest? What if we look 
at it as a way to recognize the patterns that generate the repetition of history, which keeps making everything worse, where both sides are imprisoned, where both sides are, in a sense, walled in by their own history. It's my view that a deeper understanding of history, and in particular this history and experience of the other, it is, what is, is a large part of what's necessary for transformative and generational change. Let me tell you another story about Dalia and Bashir before closing tonight. It's a story about that connection, that recognition of history and common humanity. Bashir, at the end of his visit to the house in Ramla in 1967, invited Dahlia to come visit him in Ramallah one day. And so one cold January day in 1968, Dahlia and a friend drove through a potholed West Bank to the Hairy home in exile. And there an abundance of cookies and teas were brought out by Bashir's sister. It was Dahlia's first encounter with West Bank women and for them very likely their first encounter with an Israeli not in uniform. And there the Arab and the Jew faced each other arguing over history. At one point, Bashir stood up and walked to a glass case, pointing inside. What do you see, Dahlia, he asked. Oh my God, it's one of the lemons from your visit, but why do you keep it? This lemon is more than fruit, Dahlia, Bashir said. It is land and history. It is the window that we open to look at our history. And then Bashir told Dahlia that one night when he couldn't sleep, he came out to the living room and found his father, nearly blind, pacing the floor, tears streaming down his cheeks, a lemon gripped in each hand. It was later, 17 hard years and many traumas later, that Dahlia decided she had had enough. She had had enough of pain, retaliation, pain, retaliation. And she wanted something to acknowledge that pain, something that could address a collective wound. She told me the heart wants to do something. The heart wants to move toward the healing of that wound. 1985. And with the parents now gone and the house in Ramla empty, she was living in Jerusalem, she decided that she wanted to do something to acknowledge both histories. So she sought a meeting with Bashir, who she hadn't seen in more than 15 years. They met in Ramallah at the home of Hillary's parents. And she told Bashir that she had looked into transferring the deed of the house to Bashir, but he was a Palestinian and she could not do that. So she suggested to him, perhaps I could sell the house and give you the proceeds. No, 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 cried Bashir. That is our patrimony. It cannot be for sale. So what shall we do, Bashir? I lost my childhood in that home, said Bashir. I would like it to be a kindergarten for the Arab children of the town. And so that is what it is today. A kindergarten and a house of encounter between Arab and Jew. They agreed to call it the open house. I want to argue that hope lies somewhere in recognizing a pattern and what lies beneath pain and retaliation. Hope lies somewhere in looking past one's own seeming immediate interests to those of the other, and I mean that on both sides. Today, Dahlia speaks about what she calls the three A's, acknowledgement, apology, and amends, that both sides could demonstrate one to the other. Something sweeping and remarkable, something that could actually renew and redefine, that could open the door and remake a home. Let's imagine for just a moment two small examples, that each side actually took responsibility for what has happened, a kind of truth and reconciliation, if you will. Imagine someone actually apologizing to Bashir for his family's dispossession. I am sorry. Or the mastermind of the suicide bomb attack in Dahlia's neighborhood in 2002, acknowledging the pain and tragedy. I am sorry. Naive, stupid, impossible, maybe. Inappropriate to apply truth and reconciliation to a land so devoid of such history, possibly. But at the moment, I can't think of a better idea. And before um, I dismiss, uh, you dismiss this outright, I want you to imagine one other example from this year in Australia. Imagine being in the Australian outback this past January, let's say an Aboriginal village, watching television in a community center with your family and friends, when the new Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, comes on the television to address the Parliament and you, and he says, the time has now come for the nation to turn a new page by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence to the future. For the pain, suffering, and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants, 
and their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and fathers, the brothers and sisters for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. What if there were one voice, two voices, a handful of voices that would take us further? In the open house, there is a recognition. It's something beyond denial. It's an understanding that this is one land. It may up, end up being two countries, but it is one land inhabited by two peoples. Before the visit ended, almost amidst the pointed questions and arguments, there were plenty of jokes and laughter. May you have a son, Giath exclaimed. Nuha looked at Dali and said, they only dream of sons. <laughs> Everyone. And then as they prepared to leave to go back to their house in Ramallah, Nuha leaned toward Dahlia in her bed, took her hand, and said, May you bear a healthy child, inshallah, God willing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so, I appreciate that. We do have time for some questions, um, 15 minutes or so, and I'd be happy. Uh, I don't know if any of you want to take the questions or I can just point them out. Um, yeah, whatever you like. I can. Questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. If you could speak up, because uh, it's a big room. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I think. It's, it, the question is, is, someone said that the only genuine, to, to come to the last point, it, um, the woman said that, that she's been there recently, didn't find much reason for hope, she was there in November, and that one person said the only real hope is if the U.S. economy fails and, and the United States will no longer be able to afford to give aid to Israel. I mean, it, it's, it's true that, uh, at least by a, a recent calculation, um, you know, pal Palestinian side gets... Uh, uh, the, the Israeli side makes more an interest on what they get from the United States than the entire Palestinian uh, dispersal from the United States. But I think the problems of uh, reconciliation uh, go deeper than U.S. aid. I think they have to go, I mean, I'm only talking about one thing, which is recognition and acknowledgement of history, which could perhaps create a different, um, a different point of reference and a different starting point. Um, but I think uh, the relationship, the power relationship, will remain more or less in place whether there's U.S. Uh, funds supporting Israel or not. So I, I would not say that that would necessarily change that much, although others may disagree. Yes, in the back there, sir. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. I'm down here and then up in the balcony. Sorry. Go ahead, sir. Yes, you on, on the, the ground floor. Well, you know, actually, I'm going, I'm going to invite people who are more, uh, I would like to, to shelve that question and invite people who are more actively involved with, with these kinds of questions to answer that, um, because there are all kinds of programs in place um, that, that I am less aware of than I'm sure many of the people in this room. Um, I will say that one thing that I, I think is important is that there, there are, there's a, there's a group, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the group, I'm forgetting it at the moment, but there are different kinds of groups um, where witness and mutual meeting over history take place. And I think what's important is that there, there is the possibility for transformative thought. Um, I think when people just get together and then they feel good and then they go home feeling better about themselves, uh, and then everything sort of remains the same, that's less useful than when there is actually the kind of encounter that, that creates transformative thought about uh, the, the history of the other. But I would, I would like to maybe put that at the very end of, the, of my comments, perhaps um, some, of, some of the folks that are more active could, could discuss that in, in specific. Yes, sir, you had a question up in the balcony. Is this the, the, was this promises that documented this or is this a different? Yeah, 
Oh, this is encounter. Okay, I'm getting it mixed up. Does anyone know the answer to the gentleman's question? Is to parents. Does anybody know how to reach this group? Parent circle. Uh, yeah, parent circle, right. They're on the web. Okay, that's the answer. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to defer that question uh, as I did the one before because there's people who are more knowledgeable about it than I am. Uh, yes? Well, you know, th there aren't that many, pl uh, the, the question is how as a writer um, do I deal with the, the questions uh, that this conflict sometimes raises, which is it sometimes seems hopeless. and. Um, and that this a colleague of, of, the, of the woman who just asked the question uh, said sometimes he just doesn't write because he's terrified of, of not having, uh, of just not having hope. Um, I mean, I, I think it's an excellent question. I, I think that, um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple places in the world that I've been. Unfortunately, one of them is a refugee camp in uh, the West Bank uh, where young people don't have hope. I think that's an incredibly chilling, scary, and, and very, very tragic um, reality. Um, as a writer, uh, I, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in different parts of the world. I've, I've, I've reported from a couple dozen countries and have seen a lot of people, you know, in trouble in one way or another. Uh, but I also know that, uh, you know, there's something merciful about the future is that we don't know what it is. And uh, that sound, may sound a little Pollyannish, but we don't know. Uh, I mean, look at the changes in the last 15 or 20 years. Some of them couldn't have been imagined even a few years before. Um, I mean, sometimes something transformative can happen very quickly. Um, and also, we don't know the impact of our work. Um, I mean, I remember one time uh, writing a lot about these border factories uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border called the maquiladoras, were people living in the cardboard shacks made out of the boxes that bring the US parts from the U.S. into Mexico, and people work in these factories, and writing and writing and writing about it, getting no impact, and then finding out later that someone read an article of mine, and he was on the board of one of these corporations I was writing about, and he, he demanded that housing be built for some of the work, and I only found that out by mistake. So I think we, it's not a linear, one thing I've learned over the years is it's not linear necessarily. What we do, you know, there's that old cliche about a butterfly and, and a hurricane. Um, we don't know what the impact of our work is, and so why not keep doing it? Yes, sir. Any question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions if anybody has. Yes. Not yet, and, and it's been, um, I, I've been a little bit disappointed that, I mean, so far the, the book has been translated into, uh, into Dutch and Portuguese, which I think is great, but I, I want it in Hebrew and Arabic and Spanish, French, and, and it may be translated into Bulgarian, and there's a big part of the book that is in, 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 uh, in Bulgaria, so I'm hopeful that there will be a Bulgarian publisher soon. Uh, for complicated reasons, it hasn't been published in Hebrew, even though a, a colleague wrote saying that pro bono he'd like to translate it. Uh, but because there are so many history books written in Israel, a book from an American perspective where some of that history is already familiar, traditionally those books don't do well, according to you know, Israeli journalist colleagues of mine and publishers. Um, I have a, a, a journalist colleague in Cairo who's, uh, said he was going to be talking to publishers there. Um, and I'm, I think it's, it's just slower than I th thought, but I, I definitely want it to be in Arabic and in Hebrew as well. Yes. Uh, OK, all right, sorry, right there. <laughs> well, I have. I, I've, um, you know, usually it's not very common to do a book tour two years after your book is published. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, first the hard cover comes out and you go around and then the soft cover comes out a year later. Uh, but what, what's happened, I've had a number of wonderful invitations like the one that Hilda extended to me uh, initially and, and uh, that Kathy and others uh, 
uh, and I have been talking about. Um, and I've had a number of those kinds of invitations, and then with those, I've put together some other, uh, other events. So I'm actually, I started out last Thursday in Bainbridge Island outside of Seattle, then I went to Portland. Tomorrow night I'm going to be in uh, Northampton on Friday, Washington, D.C., and then uh, I'm going to synagogues, I'm going to the Arab American National Museum, I'm going to the Islamic Society of Milwaukee, and, uh, and something sponsored by a Jewish museum in Cleveland. So I'm really grateful that, that the, the book has, because one, if somebody has a side and they recognize their side, then they, my hope has always been, well then, I guess I have to open up to, because there's the other side juxtaposed right there. And, and in, in, the, uh, in the talks that I've done, I've been very grateful that that, that, um, that coexistence of, of peoples and of perspectives can, can actually you know, exist in the same, same place. Maybe take one more question. Yes, right here. Roy? Well, um, I had, uh, first of all, w one of the things I did, and maybe I'll t take just this moment to explain a little bit about why I was absolutely adamant with myself not to have a take any poetic license with any of the with any of the story. Um, there are in the back of this book uh, are about seventy pages of source notes um, because even the small details of color of someone's clothes. If I didn't know what it was, I didn't say it, and if I did know, I would say you know where that I got that information. With the story of the Bulgarian Jews, um, I had basically two families to chronicle. And um, as you well know, Mr. Fried, because you were so helpful to me as so many other people were, um, the story of the Bulgarian Jews and the so-called rescue of the Bulgarian Jews uh, was very cr crucial to telling the story of Dahlia's family. Because if there wasn't this, what the French uh, Bulgarian intellectual uh, Tzvetan Todorov calls the fragility of goodness in his book, um, it was an amazing juxtaposition of circumstances, including uh, a history of, of very little anti-Semitism in Bulgaria compared to in the Balkans. I mean, the, the, the Ottoman Sultan in 1492 sent his ships to the Spanish port of Cadiz to invite the Jews into his empire, and he called Ferdinand and Isabella, expelling the Jews, a fool, fools, because the, he takes all his treasure and gives it to me. There was this history of people having fellowship with the Jews in Bulgaria. Not to say that there was no anti-Semitism. So you had that, and you had people standing up at crucial moments when train cars, literally in, in, in the town of Kustendil, were waiting to take the Jews to Treblinka, and not a single Jew, as you well know, uh, got on any of those cars. And so I had to spend a lot of time in Bulgaria finding out the facts of that, interviewing the survivors or the, 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 the descendants of some of the people who took heroic and very courageous and dangerous stances, Jew and Gentile alike, um, and interviewed a lot of uh, Jews among the handful who decided to stay in Bulgaria and not go along with Dahlia's family. And I just felt like this was part of the central drama of the book in terms of one family's his, historical story, and unless, and since that she was one of the two main uh, characters in the book, unless I w really found out what happened in Bulgaria, why, how does, how was it that the Bulgarian Jews were saved, and how was it then that even only five years later, 90% of that community nevertheless decided to move en masse almost uh, to Israel? What are the reasons for that? And I found out some very fascinating uh, reasons, but, but I felt that that history had to come alive if the book would come alive and read, as I was hoping anyway, like sort of like a novel. What does that tell us? Uh, what lesson is that for today? Do you have any suggestions? Well, I would just end with this because I, I, I think what's interesting is that Dahlia's, Dahlia's history is, um, is, is one in which her family was saved from a horrible fate by this amazing set of circumstances. Now everybody, uh, people react differently to their own family trauma, their own family history. But hers, her family was devoid of the 
instead of that terrible past, she, her family had something amazing that happened to them. And I think that there's an echo in that, uh, in her decision to try to share the house with Bashir. So that to me is, is one of the lessons. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, would you like to come up and answer one of those other questions? Thank you. I'm uh, sensing a deep appreciation both for the s stories that you have brought to us intertwining these narratives and the possibility of how we might move forward with them. So enormous thanks for that. And um, in terms of local things, there are many things and people can talk to Hillary and Sarah and Linda and Tanya and uh, people connected with uh, Voices for Peace in Israel-Palestine, Jewish Women's Voices. There's a fairly new project in Cambridge called the Cambridge Bethlehem People to People Project, which is really trying on a very human level to build relationships between people of Cambridge and people of Bethlehem in order to bring back some of those human stories and build and exchange uh, rooted in justice, but also rooted in relationship. Um, and people could call the Peace Commission about that. Um, we have a reception over here, so I, people in, I, the people that I know in this audience are not shy and, um, and are very uh, committed to doing the work that needs to be done around this. And so if you are looking or have questions, uh, just ask people, and I think people will be free to and willing to do that, and also for you. Um, I, I, they sign up on the mailing list. Brian, <laughs> someone can ask Brian if that's a, a task. Um, but I think also there is a way of, uh, you know, through the Peace Commission, for instance, there could be a resource network of what are the groups that, that people are doing. And so if you want to contact the Peace Commission, that that information could be made available. And, you know, I think I'm sitting here because I've been reminded in the last um, month that this is the 200th anniversary in this country of the end of the slave trade. And I think it, it is an important recognition to make as we sit in this audience deeply struggling with the narratives of Israeli Jews and Palestinians to remember our own in this country narratives denied, which have a great deal to do with our inability, I think, as a country to move forward in a spirit of justice until there is anywhere a shred of recognition of the roots of this United States built on the genocide of natives people and the wealth built on the energy and strength and, of enslaved peoples and the beginning of dealing with that and understanding those stories which have been absolutely um, subliminated for those who have won in this country, um, that our inability to do anything other than war and empire is also at deep risk. So for me, when I'm listening to the story that has been so importantly brought in the lemon tree, and this, particularly the story, half the story that we get here, not at all, um, it also reminds me of our own um, invitation to look at those, those narratives in this country. So the hopes of building something different. So thank you, Sandy, for the stories that you've told. And to Sarah and Hillary for the work that you are doing and the voices that you're bringing forward. And to the people in this audience. <laughs>
I'm Danny Glover, and in times like this, we need creative voices, imaginative voices, and we need public access so that we can hear those voices. Support Cambridge Community Television.